the one we have is called Kill the Industry. 2019, I'm sorry, 1999, we were selling that cigar for $6. Today, that cigar is $6. Same construction, same concept, same tobacco. And then the fourth one, the third one we have, it's called, it's called Fuck the Industry, and that's going to be $4. See, Same concept. That's what you like when you to start to show off live with, right? Fuck! Ah. It's okay, it's all right. That's the way we do it on Cigar Saturday. Hey, we're live now, and, and San just telling us about all of his new cigars, and we have uh, so many great things to talk about tonight. Sanj, we love the cigars you're doing. You're doing a great job with those. Thank you. Well done. It's, it's Brad Karsten, No Coast Originals, Matty Rock there in New Jersey, and, of course, Sanj. And I can't wait to see you guys. One week from today, I'll be with you guys. Really yeah. looking forward to it. I, I was hoping, Tom, you noticed my new hat. I was wearing in, in honor of Peter Tataro. Oh, nice. I do see it. What is? I, I, I think I may know what this Oh, Petey. Does this What's actually up, stand for what I think it stands for? It, it does. In fact, yeah. it does, Fuck Tom. Pete Tataro. In fact, it does, Tom. This was one of the best this. gifts that I've got in ages for myself. This, uh, this, did you just have that made to 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 to, uh, to honor Pete? Oh, this is made to order, but you know, the more people that know Pete, I think this could be a pretty big selling item. I I, I think <laughs> it. I think this is the Matty Rock Swan song. I I believe millions of people would happily wear this hat. Look, Brad, Brad's already in. Brad's like, fuck. Brad's man. gonna get one. He don't even know me. He wants to fuck Pete Tatero. He know, but he knows. He's like, if he sees that, Brad's like, give me my hat. It's either fuck Pete Tatero or fucking Pete Tatero. It, it could be either of them. Uh, oh. <laughs> all of them. But oh, well, well, is Pete going to be there? All of the will he be there next week too? Will I see him in Newburgh? You will see him in Newburgh. Yes. Oh, Pete. All Pete. right. Pete is throwing competition. Whoever throws him the farther gets a box of SP 1014s. <laughs> <laughs> Ah. Now Brad's sorry that he's coming. Oh, that's great. Well, Not well, at all, hey. I just landed in my neighborhood. That's what just happened here. <laughs> <laughs> I will just tell you if you do if there there are still a few tickets left, log on to bourbonblog.com forward slash tickets. Newburgh, New York, cigar BQ, uh a week from today, noon to four, two great causes, Newburgh Illuminated and another great cause. And I'll see Maddie and uh, Sanj next friday um this will be good and we're gonna have some great cigars aren't we Sanj? next friday uh, saturday of course of course and we got our friend cigars for warriors that'll be there as well great. so nice yeah, about the troops and all so nice mr, mr. Peter Peter Taro there for for cigars for warriors so be a lot of fun stuff in there we got a lot of fun. I, you know what i heard us i heard a radio commercial for uh cigars for warriors this past week, listening to the news, Pete. Yes, you they did. were on the news. They're, they're, we have it down in New Orleans. Um, I think we have them in Texas. Um, it's starting to really explode. It's good. It's really well good. done. I think it was um, MSNBC. It was it was TuneIn Radio. There was an audio commercial. Well done. I was like, I know those guys, and I support those guys. But uh, check all those out and come join us in Newburgh, New York. Uh, we're so happy to have Brad on with us. Where, where are you joining us from, Brad? I'm in St. Louis, buddy. Oh, I'm in well, St. Louis. You're not too far from me. I'm right on the border of Indiana and Kentucky. Are you really? Not too far from Evansville, Indiana. Yeah. Oh, I know. I know exactly where you are. I know exactly where you are. Yeah. So, so I, you I know do. that when Maddie's in Kentucky, that's you know of the of the gigs he's doing and the proximity. That's probably my best shot to get to one. Oh, because uh, it's what it's four something hours down the road, four or five yeah. hours. Yeah, yeah, oh, great road Brad, trip. I'm here at his party with Brad Tom. That's what I'm hearing. Party with Brad? Is it is it a party there at Brad's tonight, Brad? Are you having a little party? No, not at all. I'm up in my art studio because that's where I smoke cigars. Yep. And um, so everything's kind of chill. I was out at the golf course today working on my uh, working on my shots. You know, the season's just beginning here. You know, it's just kind of just getting to the spot. But the wind was blowing like 60 miles an hour today, and it was 45 degrees. And I was just like, okay, you know, people pay to go to Scotland to do this shit. So I'll, do, I'll just do it here for what it, what it normally costs. And, um, and then I got home, and my usual life on a Saturday is I'm fucking with my bulldogs. They're both criminals. They're felons. Um, 
I should have named them Reggie and Ronnie because they're like the Cray brothers, you know. Um, and uh, that's it. It's been kind of low key today. Wow, very nice. Well, uh, we're so glad to have you on the show. It's so good to see all of you, and I'm glad to see uh, Sanj and Maddie and Petey there too. Uh, it, are you the first to own this hat, Maddie? Uh, I believe so, but there's no way that it's not going to trend. So, like I said, I feel uh, I feel this is going to be a great financial windfall. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't well, think, well, I never thought that this would be my swan song, but here we are. <laughs> here it is. Here it is. Well, what's what's uh, what's been going on there at uh, No Coast Originals there, uh, Brad? What's been happening? Well, um, I don't know if you guys know. Matty knows more of what we do because we met over yeah. some of the yeah. work. Uh, a good half of my business is producing um, unscripted television shows, what most yeah. people call reality television shows. So yeah. that's about about half or a little more half my life is trying to pull that together and get out and pitch that. And Maddie and I met over one of those we we're trying to do with the late great Carl Ruiz and um, God bless him. Love him. Think about him every day. We were talking about that the other day. So that's how Maddie and I got connected, but we've been doing that for about 11 years. We've had, uh, you know, real good success. And um, we've got, you know, two shows going to contract now. Those I wouldn't be able to talk about, but we've, We've got, you know, really good stuff popping uh, on that front. And then on the other side of the business, we're a marketing company at No Coast. And we're pretty heavy in uh, in spirits marketing the last 24 years. And I mean, we're an agency of records for Grey Goose. We've done all sorts of stuff for Bacardi. And then we've moved on from the Bacardi group and we're doing a lot more. In fact, we're about to pick up a particular whiskey uh, as a... Um, as a client of ours, I'll know more about that next week, but New Amsterdam vodka, everything that comes out of uh, the Gallo side. And we also work on uh, Mount Gay Rum. Uh, oh, wow. We've done, yeah, yeah, we've, we do, we've done a lot for Mount Gay Rum and a lot of content. I don't know if you know Johnny Mosley, our Olympic gold medalist from skiing. Yeah. And he's on it. So we brought Johnny in and we did um, Sun and Ski. We did sailing video uh, content with him down in Barbados. And then we also went to Telluride and we shot a whole series with Johnny uh, in Colorado with, with skiing because uh, Mount Gay wanted to start doing Opry Ski and kind of expand from sailing. They're such a renowned sailing, you know, brand. Oh, yeah. um, and then uh, we've done work for Whistlepig um, in the past. And yeah. I actually had a whiskey of my own not that long ago coming out of one of my TV shows. Uh, wasn't a bourbon. But it was uh, an American whiskey. I was uh, exec producer on Hatfield and McCoy's uh, White Lightning on History Channel. Yeah. And we developed the uh, Hatfield and McCoy's legendary family brand whiskey out of that show. Excellent. All great products. And I, I really do like the Mount Gay Rum, of course. We actually uh, we feature Whistle Pig whiskey in a lot of our um, uh Whiskey Education Bourbon Blog does as we're on the road. Mm -hmm. so a lot of great stuff. And you said Bacardi Rum as well? Yeah, we worked at Bacardi. You know, a lot of people don't know you guys may, but um, Bacardi owns a lot of brands. I mean, they are the Bacardi family and the Bacardi yeah. rum portfolio. But, you know, they bought Grey Goose. So they own Grey Goose. They own Dewars. They own Bombay Sapphire. I mean, they own Drambuie. I mean, they own a yeah. lot of stuff. And we worked on that whole portfolio. And then we left from there. We were on that for about 15 years. And then we started really working on Gallo Spirits and then some other spirit brands. And so in the in the spirit world, we've um, there's hardly an agency that's done as much work as we have. In fact, we just launched for tequila, very high end tequila called Dobell. We yeah. just did uh, there at the Miami Open tennis tournament right now. We created their whole bar, the whole big wow. bar experience at the Miami Open tennis tournament is ours and uh, we're managing that for them as it's going on now and i'm hoping to squeeze some formula one tickets out of somebody my staff's working with down there because uh after the netflix series i'm like a formula one nut now <laughs> <laughs> very nice you're doing you're doing some great work yeah yeah, and I never was before. I wasn't in a NASCAR. I wasn't in a motorcycle. I wasn't into anything. And I watched that first season in Netflix, and I was like, fuck, I'm an F1 fan. And uh, and I started watching the races, you know, taping them and watching them from around the world. And then, uh, you know, the ones coming to Miami down by uh, uh, 
uh, right around Fort Lauderdale. It's the Dolphin Stadium is where, you know, that's the track that's going around there. And uh, I just love to see one in the U.S. I mean, I would just love to see one. I've I've not gone to Austin. Yeah, I hear they're incredible. Where would you you want to see it if you could see it anywhere? Monte Carlo. That'd be nice. But in the U.S., that is. Where would you put it? U.S., oh, uh, probably Austin. Austin Probably Texas. Yeah, 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 because they've done it for a few times, and people I know that have been there have said it's just, it's just kick ass, and and I love Texas. Yeah, I mean I love Texas, so um, that would be a, a win win. We've done a couple shows out of Texas. I know a lot of yeah. people down there. Um, yeah, that's probably where. But Monte Carlo is the, that's like the hey, you know, if if you're gonna watch, you know, if you're gonna watch God, go to the Masters, right? So you want to go to Monte Carlo? Yeah. I see we have a lot of good people joining us, uh, Chad, Alan, Randy. Uh, I see uh, Laura Banish, a mutual friend of yours and mine, uh, Brad, saying hello to you as well. A lot of good spirits. Laura. Laura. Laura, you know Laura too, don't you? I do know Laura. I haven't, oh my God, I haven't <laughs> spoken to or, or touched base with Laura in forever. Laura's she was great. huge at Bacardi. We worked together hand yeah. in glove at Bacardi all those years. Yeah, she's awesome. She's a good friend of ours too, saying hello to you. A lot of good people watching. Laura, thanks for watching. Uh, so many good people watching in the world of spirits, cigars, uh, everything, TV. I mean, it sounds like you, you're just doing so much. And you have a, news, a new whiskey client coming you can't tell us quite yet though. is that right yeah yeah i can't i can't talk to you about that it's out it's not a brand new whiskey it's right. been out we're about to finish the paperwork on on taking it out and doing some stuff with it yeah nice. yeah but we've done you know we did a lot of work for doers and we did you know other stuff in the past um never really got to work on a bourbon um and always wanted to kentucky being close i did do a little bit of stuff for maker's mark but it, the agency did but it was really tiny it wasn't it wasn't like we represented them we did a little project but i did get to tour uh the maker's mark place and then um you know it's a jim beam thing and um who's the great great grandson that's there now um you guys uh, will know Fred, no yeah i was at his house Oh, Fred's great. Yeah. Fred's they did a barbecue great. for us and oh, we went to his the house. And, oh, cool. Yeah. Freddie comes out and puts the glaze on and they ring the bell and he comes out and puts the glaze on it. And then we all had dinner and then we all went inside his house, met his wife and kids and stuff. He was great. Super hospitable. What a street that is, too. And the homes up and down there. It's just, it's just beautiful. Oh, it really is a special place uh, there in Bardstown. And uh, what a oh. cool thing. You, you're doing so many. Uh, Cool things with regard to um, you know marketing spirits. I mean, I, I think that there's been a real, um, you know, so much of it's the story, right? Whether it's whiskey or other spirits, uh, what's the story, you know, and and the real um, the passion that you are seeing important to put behind it for marketing spirits these days and whiskeys. It particular to whiskey. Um, my heartfelt opinion, and yeah. and it's kind of baked with a lot of experiences. This is that um, I think you have to have um, whatever your point of genuine authenticity is. Yeah. That's the thing you have to hang on to. Um, there's lots of wannabes, fakes, you know, really cool bottles and really nice labels. But you know, what is the the honest authenticity? that you have and it's something you can't paint on right you you have it or you don't right you know i think of like when angel's envy went out okay that was a new liquid okay yeah. and i never did dig the bottle i thought it was like a woman's perfume bottle but they got a top uh a top uh uh uh, uh mix uh not mixologist what am i trying to say distiller master distiller and you know they came up with a liquid and they marketed it great and evidently they did really well and it, yeah. and it got acquired i think it actually got acquired by the party and by they, the they moved cases. Did, yeah. yeah and they moved cases and they did a great job with it but i think the authenticity thing is a thing that you can't get knocked off your story and you and your conversation is what i'm trying to say with the consumer you can't get knocked off of that when it's legit when it's real and and if you've been doing something for a long time and this is your process and these are your people and these are your fields where you grow stuff and this is the water that your you know your great grandfather drank this whiskey he drank it with this same stream you know that type of shit is is irreplaceable um and nothing can compete against it and i and i really think 
that's the deal. And then, you know, you get the, you get the master distillers in and you guys see it, you know, all the time. There's like, Oh, we're going to, we're going to take this stuff and we're going to put it in sherry casks. So we're going to take this stuff and we're going to put it in some other type of cask and people are going to play with it. Or like down at maker's mark, you can make your own, you can make your own barrel. Right. And you, right. you go, uh, we did that. We went through their whole uh, tasting smelling process where you pick, different uh, pieces of wood that are going to get dropped in your cask and create a certain flavor profile. And I think all of that stuff is great. But at the beginning, there has to be the thing you do and have done. And that's why, you know, in marketing, when a, when a brand has that, then it's just so much more powerful, the storytelling we can do. It's so much more in point. And I think it really... Uh, generates the greatest uh, response that you want from your your uh, uh, customers, your target, your consumers, because they know they're not getting lied to. They know they're not getting, you know, a gimmick. They're not getting, they see through it, you know, they right. see through it. And everybody wants authenticity and they want to be, you know, the discovery and they want to be the ones that say, hey, here's this whiskey that's been around forever and nobody really drinks it anymore, but it's super, look what happened to Four Roses. Look what happened to Old Granddad. Yes. Right? They yeah, were just sitting around right. on the shelf for fucking ever. Nobody was buying that shit. And then all of a sudden, every hipster in the world was like, whoa, Four Roses, Old Granddad, this shit. Well, you know what? It was always good. It was good before you discovered it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had a conversation, Brad, more than a few times in the show and said, you know, you know, but again, you, you kind of said what it, what it's all about, right? It's about what's your story, but then the second part right about it, what's the experiential look like? Like, I will never name names on, on, on anything that's out there, but there's some stuff that the experiential is so powerful that it powers right over the actual, the actual product, right? Because the experiential element of it is so strong, the advertising element of so strong. So, well, I was still drinking when I was, when I was drinking Four Roses, and people be like, you're drinking four roses. I'm like, dude, never, never thumb your nose up at four roses. It's uh, oh yeah. Have, you have Tom will say the same thing. You never thumb your roses, uh, thumb your nose at four roses. No, I'll tell you what, Maddie. You know, I I uh, I stopped drinking a long time ago. It's crazy. Like I I've, I've had a 25 year you know run in the spirits industry, and and I've not drank way longer than that. Okay, but when I did drink, I was a doer's guy, and. And I would tell people, and then I ended up getting to work on the doer's brand, you know, and they would ask. And I was like, I, I can tell you from the very beginning, like that was the scotch that everybody in New York drank, right? That's the one that was always poured. That was a deal. But here's the thing. They made a claim. They always made a claim. The taste that never varies. That's the thing that doers said. And that's what they are. And you know what? Doers was a great scotch. It was right. a great scotch. And then it became, oh, we have to get more refined and we have to. And people were looking for ways to be so much more different than someone else because they could understand the difference from, you know, whatever, Islay and these types of peats and this type of stuff. And I'm fine. You know, single malt scotches have been around forever and all that shit. But so much of that was just conversation. I mean, it was like some of the basics, the mainstays forever. They were they were perfect. Right. <laughs> they never needed to be changed. Right. Right. Look, like Never. There's another thing we've discussed on the show before and they in the 90s and everything. It was absolute, absolute, absolute. I wasn't an absolute guy. I was a Stoli guy. And uh, there was nothing that you could you could not hide from an absolute ad. Right. Think about the end of the 80s and the 90s. You couldn't you couldn't hide from an absolute ad. So it was everywhere. I can't believe you're drinking Stoli. I'm like, dude, Stoli is and will always be a staple vodka. So mm -hmm. just shows yeah. you our advertising. And the power of having a marketing budget where you can be in somebody's face. And like I said, right. it still winds up becoming so much part of the product, right? Oh, man, I'll tell you, of all the uh, – I've obviously, I've talked to a lot of really senior marketing executives and spirits executives over the years. And I'm now going to say, and I'm not going to say their names, but they were CEOs of major, major spirits manufacturers, okay? And all three of them. In conversations about bourbon, remember when bourbon just really started to get crazy again and everything? Oh, yeah. And all that stuff. So down the line a little bit, having a conversation with these guys, and all three of them picked the number one bourbon that they believed, not just for price. It did not have a steep price. So that wasn't the basis. 
but for consistency and the finest liquid in the bottle for what it was was old forest it is a nice one i do all three of them yeah it is really good and and of course really big in louisville not too far away from us and just such a great uh brand and such good insight i mean from you i mean again you know thinking about what really helped bourbon uh uh really propel bourbon a good decade ago we started bourbon blog about 16 years ago we've been following the story ever since but it's that authenticity that i think really helped to reignite bourbon uh and the ability to tell those stories just like you said yeah i'll tell you there's something we're doing right now it's wide open because you yeah actually walk into it um we built in Napa uh, a place called the Brandy House. Oh. And if you look it up, it's absolutely gorgeous. Our design, we finished that. We did it for Gallo. Okay. And they have, as everyone knows, Gallo has a number of really great brandies, not just the E&J. They've got the Argonaut line. And then they've got a much even a higher, higher end of brandy. And the goal there is much like Kentucky. To make California the home of brandy. Yeah. Kentucky's the home of bourbon. California is the home of brandy. Yeah. And to get people into the authenticity of what brandy is, is the thing that's going to propel brandy the same way it did with bourbon. Like this is real. This is a real American drink. You know, the original old fashioned was made with brandy. They call it a Wisconsin old fashioned now, but it was actually made with brandy. Brandy was what, you know, they drank in the colonies. There was uh, right. whiskey came along late. And then when you look at the development of bourbons and whiskey, American whiskeys, but particularly bourbons from that one region, and then you look at what brandy has. They have a place in time and, and, and locale that makes them authentic, that makes them real. And if they're not from there, mm, you know, sure, people are doing some cool shit, High West, other stuff. Yeah, they're all doing this stuff. But bourbon's from Kentucky. And, and that's the authenticity that, you know, I think consumers are really gravitating towards, which is they're so used to being fooled by shit by marketing. They get hit with it all the time. They get hit with cool stories. They get hit with all this other stuff. But when it comes down to it, they want the real thing and they want to be able to tell other people. That's the big thing in the marketing side. People want to discover and then share the story with others that don't know it. They want to be the ones that are the discover. They want to be the ones who then are, are, you don't pay them. You don't have to force them to do it. They want to proselytize for you. They want to go out and say, look what I found. This is legit. This is real Horween leather. This is a real, you know, old time Orvis watch. This is this, this is that. And you look at that stuff in shoes, watches, belts, clothing across the line in men's stuff, particularly primarily men's stuff. I'm talking about bourbon, whiskeys, brandies. Those are all in that same space. They want the real stuff. They want the real story. I've been hearing about uh, what Ansley and um, Uber have been doing there. Uh, it's, I mean, I've been hearing, I haven't seen it yet. It's pretty new, right? What's that? The Brandy, Brandy House? House? The Brandy House, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, well, you know, we opened at the beginning of COVID because, you know, if there's nothing, if, if yep. nothing else, I've got great timing. And, <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, but we were able to pull it off and we were able to get it rolling up in Napa. So, uh, right. yeah, that is, uh, that's the stuff that's going on up there. And it, it's a multi-use space and that, you know, you can bring in chefs and do dinners and you can bring the trade in and educate and then consumers can walk in and just try and walk out with a bottle. You know, there's all that stuff that's happening there. And it's been a major success, been a major success. And it's a beautiful space, beautiful space. So I... Uh, I've been hearing about it. And, and looking back at the beginnings of American whiskey, I mean, the brandy was so important. It is going back to the roots. I had been hearing, you know, uh, a lot of experts agreeing that brandy would become the next big thing. And it just might. Yeah, I think the brown spirit consumer is a, is a, a discerning character, right? Right. And wants to try different flavor profiles and might want to try the original. of such, Like they may love the old fashioned. And then say, you know, I'd love to know what the original old fashioned tastes like, which you can get at the Wisconsin supper clubs anytime. You go up to Wisconsin, when they make an old fashioned, it's with brandy. Right. Right. Some of the original mint juleps back in the day in New Orleans. Yes, sir. 
with brandy and uh, so many other cocktails too. So what an exciting yeah, and it drifted. You know, yeah. it drifted. It became something you pour on and light. You know, you flambe with it. It became, you know, an old man's drink or old ladies would drink a, a sip of it, a small amount of it after dinner. It just kind of went into that that sort of decay that it became an old person's thing, which is what happened when we when we first got brought in and, and took on Bacardi, Bacardi rum all those many years ago. It had been focus grouped as, you know, an old man's rum, my grandfather's rum. And it was trying to get it introduced to a new group of people and get, you know, younger people to realize this is a great entry level cocktail. The Cuba Libra is a real drink. It's an authentic drink. It's been around forever. It has an incredible legacy. And, you know, it's a great way to start. It's sweet. You know, it's got a lot of stuff with it. So that's that's kind of the thing that I think I envision is going to happen with Brandy. You're always going to have the connoisseurs who are going to have the super high end stuff and they'll sniff her and they'll smoke cigars and they'll do it in the traditional way, but then there will be cocktails and an old time cocktails made with it that are legit. Cause you, we've all seen it. Like a lot of brands have gone out and tried to make the, the, the more popular version of cocktails with their particular liquid. I mean, I've seen scotches do, you know, scotches try to make like a, like a tequila sunrise with scotch and shit. And it's like, you know, someone just needs to shoot those people and throw them in the alley. I mean, they, they, you, you're just not going to do that stuff, right? The well, when you go you go back it. to the originals, huh? The witness protection lawyer said to watch that shit. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Maddie, the, those who travel lightest travel swiftest. So I don't have a lot on my back and I can get away in a hurry. <laughs> well played, sir. And see what I just said? I, I, I smell some events in the future. What do you think? That I've uh have some liquor guys, have some cigar guys. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm gonna tell you something. There's the, the place that I think that is right for that, and we're developing something on that front. So um I'll let you know. I don't think it's gonna be a problem, like you know, a piece of intellectual property or anything, but I'm gonna tell you where I think that really plays out. And I think that not the only place, but one of the more natural places for that to play out is at member guests at golf clubs across the country. There's thousands of member guest events that are happening all over the country. And when you go to them, the ones that are smart, they're bringing in high end liquids and cigars because that's what guys want. And you can do the pairings. And you've got a captive audience. Now, it only might, might only be 120 guys or 200 guys or whatever, but they're there for the whole fucking weekend. They're the exact right target, and they're locked in, and they're there to have a good time. And I really think the cigar bourbon, cigar whiskey, cigar brandy, whatever, cigar vodka, however you want to do it, together going at uh, uh, member guest programs in golf, I think is a super smart play. I do, too. I agree. We've been seeing that um, more and more as well. Uh, country clubs, golf clubs, uh, cigar, whiskey events. I actually just hosted a um, uh, whiskey tasting portion of a um, a golf tournament in Palm Springs about three and a half weeks ago for the nice. Warburton. Uh, Patrick Warburton, the actor, um, has a foundation that helps support St. Jude. And we yes. had uh, Alice Cooper out there and Mike Mills of REM and a lot of great people. Big golfers too, both of Big them. Big golfers too. That's right. So they were out there. They loved it. We were just glad yeah, you know, golf part in it. We do a lot of research on golf. We just got. We did the Grey Goose Lounge for years, which toured all the major PGA events. And then um, just recently, we launched for High Noon. Um, okay. This also, we just launched a a lounge of similar size and presence at. Uh, PGA events, and we're going to do a handful of them this year, and we're going to do more next year. And that connection with golf and the country club thing and the stuff that I, I get a lot of research, right? So I look at this stuff. Right. Everyone in golf is calling this decade the Roaring Twenties because COVID created a space where that was about one of the only things people could do. Right, And they went out and they played a lot of golf. And country clubs saw a resurgence during COVID. They saw a bump and people became members that probably wouldn't have become members. And regular golf courses saw a bump, which meant the manufacturers saw a bump, which meant the ball guys and the clubs and, every, and the apparel guys. And it's carrying on. 
and everyone is looking at the the twenties as being the moment for golf to really resurge, and that's why I think these tournaments, charity tournaments, um, pro ams, and uh, member guests have never been better for people that do what we do, which is promote these types of products because the guys will be there. They will be there. And look at all the other things that are part of that that also went up in their percentages. More people spend time smoking cigars, trying to refine their palate. More uh, people yeah. spend time going deeper into uh, going deeper into uh, into the wines and spirits, learning more about bourbons and and rye and everything else. And uh, and I think I think the right number on the cigar side was something like eleven to thirteen percent more. Uh, tobacco was sold for on the cigar side. Tom, I don't know wow. what that number is on, on the other yep. side. It's big, yeah. You know, and it gave that's people, a that's a big bump. Yeah, yeah, that's a tremendous bump. And like I said, it gave people time to to have a hobby that you could really get into. I mean, geez, with the availability of of a fine product now, people's knowledge and 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 the, the ability to get all new things into market, like when the first cigar boom crashed out, there was no more product left, right? So that created, you know, a kind of a void. But then after that, you got, you know, Nicaragua really opened up. Um, yeah, they yeah. Got, were able to get tobaccos they haven't had before. It wasn't just, you know, it's all about uh, about DR Cuba. And people, hey, I'm getting stuff out of Brazil. I'm getting stuff. These rappers are from Ecuador. Um, in the 90s, we really learned uh, how important Cameroon, Cameroon was. And right, people kept building and building. Yes. Yeah, and and I think the thing there too is that that we've learned is particularly in a time of crisis, not always, but particularly in a time of crisis, those little luxury indulgences that are affordable really jump. You know, so you may not be in a regular habit of treating yourself to a cigar, but as you go, when people went through COVID, they probably were doing more of it because it was like, you know, I'm out by my fire pit now because I don't go to the office or I'm at home and I can have it home. I'm not going to the office. I'm not doing this stuff. Or I can I, I can indulge in this particular or I'm going to go treat myself to that bottle of bourbon that I normally wouldn't buy because fuck it. I can't do anything else. I can't go to dinner. I can't go to restaurants. So I'm going to have this at home. And people, like you said, Maddie, they're they're educating their palate. They're finding what they like. They're also getting those little luxury indulgences, which emotionally connects them to a brand, right? right? And they're and they're feeling like you know that that I looked forward to having that at the end of my day or whatever. You know, we're all going through some shit, and that that stuff really you know tasted great or made me feel good or whatever it is. Yep. Uh, wines in particular, you know, wines did, did the same thing. So I think anything that was in that uh, indulgent luxury indulgence space. Um, was you know it's not going out and buying a you know a mercedes i'm talking about you know the stuff largely consumed you know higher end chocolates did yeah. very very well uh i read a report on how these uh local confectionaries that were doing their own really great uh uh unique types of of chocolates and candies did very well during that time because you can't go out to eat but you can place an order go in get some take it home and people were getting into that there's a great one down. It would be, but you get to Nashville, right? I mean, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. There's a great candy company in Nashville called Bang Candy Company. They oh, got yeah. two pistols. Yeah, Bang That's Candy right. Company is a great example of that out of Nashville. Yeah, well, they they do a nice job. Lives, right? There was it was. We never thought we'd ever see something like the Spanish flu ever again, and we didn't for a hundred years. So all those things, right, that we took for granted, were were taken away. So. Mm -hmm. You know the that aspect of normalcy. What do you have to do to get that aspect of, of normalcy back? You have to find things that you can do. You know, this is how all this looked. Let's be honest. This is how Zoom and everything else really started. How can right. you connect? Because at the end of the day, human beings are social creatures, man. And um, you killed out a huge part of the, you know, of 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 what it is to be a human. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do to make it up? This became the way to be with other people. Tom was able to go out there and to do, you know taste things like this over over the internet where everybody could share their thoughts um so again it became incredibly important experiential things uh like i said over cigars and everything else uh what we're smoking now gave sanj the extra time that he needed in Chicago yes. time to put something like this together that they could under normal circumstances you wouldn't have the time this place was hustling and bustling you could have a 
150, 250 people in the shop. Like I said, Brad, we talked about even filming stuff here. There's an outside area that holds, you know, three, 400 people. It's like, that was gone. So what, what are you going to do? How can you possibly replace that essence of togetherness? And this was, this was the next best thing that you're able to bring things to market that you wouldn't have normally had out or had the time to do. And this was another way to bring people together, you know, in the digital world to discuss all these things. Uh, yeah. And I, I think it was important too, that it was over something um, when you're having that digital experience that some people had done occasionally, you know, conference call stuff, but they hadn't really done it as a mainstream part of their life. So now they're doing it right. But what's that real sensory thing that you can add to that? Right. And so now people can have a smoke, they can have a drink, they can talk and share about it. They went into sensory deprivation because of COVID, but then now there was this sensory opportunity that allowed them to sort of engage and do stuff. We worked with a number of clients where we were sending out cocktail kits to people that would sign up and then want to learn how to make the cocktails. Because a big part of our business is, you know, we make television shows, so we're really right. good at that. And we brand and we're really good at that. Digital content is a big thing for brands these days. Well, you know, the way we look at it is if I can get people to watch 40 minutes of one of my television shows, I'll probably get them to watch a minute of your show. So we would be able to, we would, we would then be able to create these content series and we'd say that the kits would be sent out and then people would sign up and come on a group zoom and learn and mix the cocktails together with the mixologist and then have them. Right. So that was the only way we could do experiential. Normally we're putting liquid to lips because you're meeting us somewhere and we're making it for you. Like we are back again now in Miami and right. you show up at the Dobell thing and you get the cocktail. Well, you can't do it. We couldn't do that for over a year. So the only way we could do it was send this stuff to you and have you join us by having the, the, you know, the brand ambassador or the master mixologist for a particular brand engage you on zoom, walk everybody through it. And everybody had like a happy hour. And, you know, people are doing that on their own. Remember all those Zoom happy hours? Everybody was, they get together with all their friends and they get dressed up and, they, and they'd make appetizers and they'd make cocktails. And there'd be 30 people on Zoom and they'd yeah. just all be catching up, drinking and eating. And they found that there was a way to bring people from different places in the country together and they're still enjoying it. And just like, mm -hmm. hey, all of you watching right now, if you have any questions for Brad, ask them below. I see so many good friends that... Uh, you know, we see you all every week, but so many of you all joining us in, Duque, Walken, uh, Ed, Luis, uh, definitely take a moment, like this, share this, everybody, ask questions to Brad um, about the um, the spirit space, the branding space, also uh, reality TV. Okay, on the um, the authentic storytelling on spirits, which, uh, you know, we, you and I both know, we all know, all of us here, how important mm -hmm. that is, that... I wouldn't say trend, but that's, you know, what's popular. People want a real story. How is that, um, you know, going over into reality TV? And uh, what what are you seeing as far as trends go, as far as what's coming up? So there was a big shift. Interesting question. Thank you for that. There was a big shift a number of years ago. I think you can all remember when, like, um, okay, Discovery had a show called Amish Mafia, right? And I'm not taking a shot at Discovery Channel. I mean, everybody was pitching all kinds of stuff. Right. And, like, people started to get, like, you know, this wasn't like really real, right? It wasn't really happening. And there became kind of a reckoning on those types of shows where now if you're going to go into and produce one of those, and I'm not saying the other ones, it still doesn't in some form in some networks or whatever, still doesn't get done. But for us... We completely cut off looking at anything like that. We had never produced anything like that. We had a look at some where we might, you know, kind of dutch it, juice it a little bit, you know, <clears throat> for network taste, audience taste. And we got away from it because we couldn't back it up. And now the only thing that we look for is real characters. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you this. The, the secret to our sauce is that we don't come up with an idea for a show and then go figure out how to make it. What we do is we meet people. People are interesting enough. And if they're really doing it, we'll figure out if there's a show around them. Now it's authentic from the beginning. It's baked into it, the DNA. And the thing that is, you know, some people talk about it gets a little unauthentic and like it still is TV. Sometimes the camera misses something. 
Sometimes the mic breaks. Sometimes somebody says something better the second time. It's actually happening. It's a real thing, but you might have to take it again just so you get it right for the show purposes. But you're not setting it up so that it, it becomes something, you know, you're not creating the false stuff, which is what you started to see in a lot of shows, you know, where um, you get a show that gets on and all of a sudden it gets ratings. It gets, you know, look at a lot of paranormal stuff. It right. gets uh, it, it gets some success. They start to run out of real shit, but nobody wants to give up the cash cow. So you start making shit up so you can keep a show on you, you know, and that's that's what you see happens. Right. And then that's jumping the shark. That's all kinds of things. But social media is so quick. People get on stuff so fast. And unless you know you're along for the ride, like, hey, we kind of know they're faking it, but we still like it. You know, if you're along for the ride, it's cool. But if you're being fooled, it's not. And so in the television business, from my perspective only, from my company's perspective only, we begin with somebody that's really doing something. Right. And then, then we see like, hey, is there, is there something that can be turned into a show about this or a format that can be made out of this that the audience would enjoy you know, being engaged in. And and that's how we take it. But the person we begin with is real. So we always start with people. There are no ideas in our hopper, like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could find somebody that does this? Like, no, we don't do that. We just, people come to us. You just see it. Yeah, you, they come to you. You see it, you meet them, yeah. you get referred, whatever. Carl, the late, great Carl, got referred to me by another chef when we were talking to him about an idea for a show. And when Carl came on and we talked um, on the phone the first time, we knew we had a different show and it was all about how he was. We just knew the idea that was started with another chef was dead and it was this is the way it was going to go. And how long he was hit. Talk about Ruizing, right? Because Ruizing legitimately became a part of life, right? Ruizing. Mm -hmm. Part of the understanding is you go out there, you enjoy, you love, make love, you know, the core of it was love what you love with your food, be unapologetic about it. So Carl could eat, I mean, we've had, we had the conversation when we were sitting down, you could either eat the finest steak or it could just be, you know, a literal dive with the burger. How much do you love and enjoy it? There was nothing disingenuous about it. It's like, what do you love? And let's be honest with real human beings, it's both sides, right? You can have a most luxurious meal on the planet that cost you 2,500 bucks to eat by the time you're all in and with a fine wine or fine spirit with it. Or you could go to, you know, like I said, where I live is the home of, of dives. Or you could go to Johnny Hanges or, or White Manor or Rutt's Hut, knock out a couple of, 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 you know, the best burgers and dogs that you've ever eaten. And that experiential moment that you had, the enjoyment was the same. It wasn't, it wasn't about money. It wasn't about pomp and bravado. It was about that experience at that moment and how much you were living and enjoying that moment as it was, right? And that's what Carl wants. One hundred percent. I'll tell you what Carl and I used to talk about was, I would uh, I came out to St. Louis to go to St. Louis University. Okay, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, so I was like the only guy from my high school that went out to the Midwest. Everybody else stayed East Coast. They thought I was what the fuck was wrong with me. But anyway, I came out. Hey, I was blue collar family. They gave me a deal. It was a college I could actually afford to go to. It was a private school. That's how that all went. Out. So I come out, I come out to St. Louis U. And so you bring girl talk friends home at Christmas, Thanksgiving, as you do. And of all the places in New York that you could take somebody to show up to say, here's a great meal. Of all the things you could do, Peter Luger's on down the line. Where did I always take everybody? Fucking Nathan. Because it's a staple of what New York right. is. And that's the big point. What what symbolizes New York? That is nothing of New York, right? So nothing tasted like New York to me when I got back home, like a couple of Nathan's dogs, crinkle fries, or maybe a knish with mustard. That's all I wanted. Yeah. And I would bring them there and they would never have anything like that. And they'd be like, oh, my God. And I'd say, see, you come out here to Midwest. They all call it Coney Island dogs. Right. They call them Coney. And they're hot dogs with chili and onions and all this other shit on it. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to tell you something. 
That doesn't exist on Coney Island. I'm going to tell you something else that doesn't exist on Long Island. A Long Island iced tea. It doesn't fucking happen. <laughs> it's not there. Okay? I don't know how these things got their names, but they're not from there because I am and I would know. <laughs> we don't know how that happened. <laughs> you know, when you go out to the Midwest, you're like, what did you call them? Like, yeah, you got to get some dirty water dogs. Like, I don't, I don't think I like how that sounds. Like, I don't give a shit you like how it sounds. You want some dirty water dogs. You want some surprise. Oh, so everyone's like, all right, this, this was awesome. I'm like, this is, and again, we just, just said it. that's the experiential, right? When I was a kid, I was first working in the city. You could get two dogs and a friggin' Yoohoo for $2.50. And, you know, talk about sacrilege. I worked at 645 Fifth Avenue across the street with St. Patrick's Cathedral. So me and my <laughs> dog, my freaking you who's sitting on the steps of St. Patrick's Cathedral. And I was happy as a pig in shit. I got to tell you, my favorite breakfast in New York, and I would do this with people when I bring them up. They go, where do you want to go do breakfast? I said, I'm not really a big breakfast guy, but I got a favorite place. And they're like, okay, let's go there. And I would go to the fucking coffee stand on the corner. And I get a coffee regular, which they didn't they didn't understand was cream and two sugars, you know. And it's the only place I drink coffee regular is in New York. I don't drink it that way anywhere else on the planet. I order coffee regular in New York and I get a butter roll. <laughs> and I walk down the street with my coffee and my roll, and that's my breakfast, and that tastes like New York, and I couldn't be any goddamn happy. Hey Brad, Pete is staring across at me. This is important. <laughs> is it Taylor Ham or pork roll? Is it what? You call it Taylor <laughs> Hammer Pork Roll. Well, I don't call it either because they don't have that out here, but oh. I know it's I know it's Taylor Ham. I know the right ah. answer. <laughs> Read but, that. How about, how about, Read but, that. Carl, but Carl taught me that. Okay. <laughs> Did you did you learn how to read? In oh, grammar he's school? he's just gonna keep shit talking. That's right. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. Here's the difference. Is that what's is that? What, it's, that's Peter, right? Yeah, yes. I know you don't yeah. understand midget, so I'll have him explain. Now, now, here's the deal. I had to have this talk with well, Carl understood it differently with other people. Carl introduced me to. Here's the difference, Peter. See, I'm from Brooklyn. I don't know shit about Jersey because we don't give a fuck about Jersey. Oh. I've never been there. All right. <laughs> That's if I'm in Jersey, I'm lost. <laughs> well, in my best Morgan Freeman voice, well, shit. <laughs> well, shit. <laughs> Except for that place Carl took me up uh, the, uh, oh, God, where that Norwegian town that's, it's all square heads in Jersey. He took me there Telemark with the. Uh, Tavern, baby. Telemark Tavern. <laughs> yeah. The Telemark Tavern. Telemark Tavern. And I go walking in, and I'm I'm half Norwegian and half Scottish, okay? First born in the U.S. World War II ends, they come over here. I'm first born in the U.S. And I go in there, and I'm like, what the fuck? This place looks like my, my, my family's house with the Norwegian flags and this shit. We're talking cookies, and they're like, oh, there have been 10, 15,000 of us living over here forever. Never knew about it. Yep, yep, yep. Never knew about it. As soon as you said it, I'm like, tell them our tavern, baby. Telemark Tavern. Yeah. There's an authentic place. <laughs> yep, that was a uh, that was about as Norwegian as you could get not being in Norway. Mm-hmm. So guys, what's the last real authentic bar in New York? Like I was a McSorley's guy, but from like the 70s, uh, I was a McSorley's guy. So what's what's left? I mean, honestly, when you're talking about all the, the old school bar, McSorley's still, and like I said, and blessedly the steakhouse survived. So we yeah. were just about Peter Luger's, right? Well, for me, Carl and I had had this conversation with a bunch of people, and everyone was going Luger's. Carl, Carl was on Team Maddie Rock for this. It was Keens in Midtown? Mm, no uh, doubt, I agree. Hundred uh, percent agree. I think Keens is the greatest New York steakhouse ever. Luger's gets well, all the shine, and Luger's is great for its own thing. Keens is the place. I'll be I'll be there on Tuesday. So Keens, like I said, Tom, Tom and I discussed. We got to find time to get. Yes. Tom the the the, uh, the ceiling is lined with corn cob pipes. Everyone learned can... it's clay pipes. It's clay pipes from way back in the day. And the thing to get there is the mutton chop. A legendary the mutton chop, mutton kids. Chop. Yes. Yep, yep. Ed, Ed, and a man who knows his food. Ed. Ed. Means for the win. So what you do? You go into the group of people. You get a couple of legendary mutton chops. You split that as your appetizer because we're fucking savages. Then you go for the steak and everything else. And by absolutely the time you come absolutely back, your life expectancy goes down because of all the <laughs> also, they have, 
complexion of bourbons and scotches. Oh, yeah. They have, they have a great oh, look. Oh, my Lord. And the other thing that's great about it is it's a New Yorker's bar. There's a, a restaurant. It's not a tourist place. No, not at all. No tourist. It's not a tourist place at all. It's legit, and it's in the same building it's always been in. They used to have the Lamb Club upstairs, which was like the club that did all the th – when they competed against Broadway. Herald Square competed against Broadway, and that was the Lamb Club. And so it's – what does it have? New York authenticity. Yep, and there we go. Like I said, like the uh, original um – the hell is it downtown? The the old steak place downtown in the curb. Old the, homestead? Not the home homestead is great. Not the homestead. Um, it'll it'll give me a second. Downtown, Wall Street, ancient building. Oh, mm. brain fart. It'll come to me before uh, before we wrap. But yeah. So luckily, COVID didn't murder places like that. So the institutionalized places, a bunch of them still are are, are still there. Blessedly, you know, COVID did not murder them. So you can still go throw down and and, uh, and have your steak there and everything else. And like I said, I'm happy as a pig and shit. I'll be there on Tuesday. And there's nothing like those places because you're stepping into a time capsule of people who knew what really great shit was yes. decades before you went there. Right. You know, it's like why I love going to places that I knew Sinatra went to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because he knew good fucking places like up on Arthur Avenue. Or the Golden Steer in Vegas, or uh, uh, Musso and Frank's in L.A. I mean, he knew these places, the and they were real staples, not not a tourist. That's right, actual That's staples. Right. And they were they were legit because they were cool before anything else was. Cool. Delmonico's got it. Yeah, yeah. The original Delmonico's downtown. I think so. One hundred and thirty-four years old, one hundred and thirty-five years old, something ridiculous like that. So, oh, absolutely. You know, and it's not like what happened in Chicago where, you know, the Chicago Chop House got bought. You go in there now, you know, you know, not not picking anybody, but it's like, here's our two ounce filet. I'm like, come here. We need to talk to you. I want my dirty bar, I want my 72 pound steak. Uh, what happened? You know, I've never been able to finish a steak at Keene's. No matter how hungry I went in, there was no fucking way I was going to be able to finish that steak. It just yeah. it wasn't going to happen. You know, yeah. and the authenticity thing, like out here, the big authenticity thing is there's a couple of them, but the real big one right. Right. is bar is barbecue. Yeah. Right. And barbecue oh, yeah. also goes great with whiskey, right? And right. bourbon, and and they're right. locked together. In, right. Uh, right. In, Do a little. Missouri. What's that, Maddie? Ar Arthur Bryant's. Arthur Bryant's is 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 good, still good in in Kansas City. But there are other ones like there's one in St. Louis that won a James Beard Award. And the guy started at the farm and only got this type of heritage hog and only did this. And he was a French trained French chef. And he opened a place called The Beast. And you will never have better barbecue. And everybody says this. I get it from the Carolinas to Texas. I argue with Texas people all the time about it. And I'm like, no fucking way. You're not getting anything better than what this guy does at The Beast. Because he starts when the pig is born. Wow. Isn't there a place that, yeah. Poppy's Smokehouse? Is it Pappy's? Poppy's? Yeah, Pappy's. Yeah, Pappy's is good. Really good. It's one of my favorites in the city. Yeah, good job there, Maddie. That's down in our old area, Soulard. That's in St. Louis, 100%. Um, you know, and that's that's a, a, a big thing. But I think, you know, St. Louis is kind of known for Italian food. We have our own. Oh, yeah. We my office. Well, my office is on the hill. It's on the hill. Wow. Okay. Right. We're on the hill because what, it's a pedestrian. favorite place on the hill, or a couple favorites. Yeah, there's there's a number of good places on on the hill. The 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 crazy thing is, the restaurants are fine, but they've twisted to become more of like what everybody wants when they go to visit the hill. So it's not as unique. But G and Tony's is still really good okay. for that that sort of food. There's a place called Antonino's that we go to that does Greek and Italian, but Volpi sausage, which is world famous. I ate a pizza in Norway that had Volpi fucking sausage on it. Okay, wow. that's that is is three blocks from my office. People okay, sleep. Where, where they are, and and the little grocery stores are still there, man. Like when we were growing up, and you, there were no well, at least when I grew up in Brooklyn, I never saw a supermarket till we moved to Long Island. 
We went to the bakery. We went to the butcher shop. You went to the fruit stand and vegetable stand. You did all that shit. You know, the joke is right. You up Little Italy. I'm like, more people went to Arthur Avenue. Like, there are people today that will still argue with you. Like, Little Italy really was was Arthur Avenue in the Bronx. I mean, you had your play. You had Mulberry Street and all the all the stuff downtown. But 100%. What, what happened is it turned into more tourist places, right? That's 100%. Umberto's became touristy. All of it became touristy. Arthur Avenue is legit. It's a real place. In fact, you know, do you guys know uh, Pauly? Pauly Cigars up on Arthur Avenue. Hey, and rolls. He's a good kid. Yep, and roll cigars. Yep. Yeah, uh, Pauly. We tried to do a show with him. He just called me the other day. His dad retired from NYPD. He was head of security for Yankee Don, Stadium Don, forever. Sanchez has thirty years and he knows all those guys. So yeah, Pauly, right out yeah. of Arthur Avenue, and roll cigars. Yep. Yep, yeah, right in the right in the mall in there where all the baker shit is. He owns that whole thing now. He just did a Chaz Palm and Terry line of cigars. Yep, yep. He's been he's been doing it for years. Long time. Really an amazing character. Really oh. an amazing character. And his sidekick, Squiggy, is incredible. Squiggy's a made guy. And so Squiggy says, I'm gonna get when we're shooting him for the thing, Squiggy goes, I'm gonna do you a favor. I'm gonna give you a tip. I'm like, okay. And he goes, anybody ever says, hey, come on over, see what's in the trunk? Don't go. <laughs> that was right. Gentlemen, heard that twice in one show we talk about witness protection stuff. That's two. It's not like yeah. everyone gets one. That's two. Those. <laughs> two witness protection shows. Yeah. Well, it's not like Sammy the Bull is going to come on and ask questions. But, I mean, it, that that's a legendary place, Arthur Avenue. And the Hill... That's what that is here in St. Louis is Arthur it's Avenue. There's only two left in the in the United States. It's Arthur Avenue and it's the Hill. The Hill. Yeah. And for the most part, we're blessed. Remember, they really kept South Philly. The, 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 South, the South Philly, they've done a good job South preserving Philly. it. Pain in the ass to drive in and out because the streets are still narrow. But I absolutely agree with you. So is that is that is that is that fish hook? Yeah, and by fish term town? terminal and everything else, yep. And you could still yeah, go, yeah. still go into South Philly. You could still get your supplies. You still get the the the, the meats, the cheeses. The, and it's amazing because it's almost like time has forgotten the place. You could go down there, get a friggin' bushel of blackberries, a friggin' some fresh prosciutto, some pecorino romano, and you know, mm. yeah, that's the one thing yeah. because real estate in New York got so expensive. You're paying still in those parts of Philly. You can have, you could have a grocery bag that that's not going to bang you more than going to a commercial grocery store where you're getting shit. That's what these guys are doing on the Hill. There's two. There's Viviano's and there's Di Gregorio's. And they're the two original old-time grocery stores that fed the families on the Hill forever from when the Hill began. Generationally owned, right? Really authentic. And the thing I love, John Viviano, um, what he does is he's got a secret. It's, it's a secret kitchen, okay? He's a grocery store. But if you know, you walk in the back behind the meat counters, all that. He's got tables set up, and it's a restaurant, and you just order whatever you want for lunch, that's and they'll cook it and make it. It's wow. safe. That's how you did it years and years ago. It'll come to me. There's a place left in Jersey, and uh, a couple of places, actually a couple, one in particular that Carl and I used to go to. Literally two Italian grandmothers. You go and sit, but okay, sit. You go around the back of the side. There's fresh ravioli. Uh, there, there's there's rigatoni cooking up in the pot. There's Sicilian sauce that's been cooking for. Friggin', you know, Crazy. seven hours. You know, it's just oh, yeah. they're doing it all real there. All the sauces are real. All the, you know, all mm. the pastas are real. All of it's it's just absolutely great. And the old grandmas and everybody that still live on the hill in those little, you know, uh, shotgun brick houses that are all over the place down in Brooklyn, they come in and they're shopping and they buy their bottle of Chianti and they get their shit and they're doing it and they've been doing it forever. They used to sell the Catholic school uh, uniforms in in those grocery stores. And everybody went to St. Ambrose and they all went into the grocery stores to buy their Catholic school uniforms and shit. I mean, they're the real deal. I'll tell you a really funny thing about the Hill that you might not know. It goes back to tying it back to booze is um, during uh, Prohibition. Um, there are these things called sugar tunnels and they run all under the hill. People are going to do some piece of new construction. They end up running into a fucking sugar tunnel. The Paisans back then would dig these sugar tunnels from the bakeries to the secret distilleries where they could make the booze. And the, and the, the bakeries were allowed to order sugar 
because they were a bakery and you needed sugar to make booze, but the government controlled it. So if you didn't have a bakery, you couldn't order the shit. So they had these sugar tunnels and the bakeries would overorder the sugar and then they go underground and they take all the sugar to the secret distilleries and make their booze. Wow. And the sugar tunnels are still all over the hill. That's amazing. It's pretty cool, right? Yeah. Yeah, you gotta come hang out with you in St. Louis sometime, my friend. Hey, you gotta look Love me that. up, man. It's uh it's oh. a cool old cool old river. Yeah. Good bourbon. It's been a while since I've been over to the hill. I know it's a good place. But oh, it's great. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. And it's a uh, it's a great old neighborhood. And it's, you know, it's real, you know, <clears throat> and the people are real and they've lived there forever and they built it and they're proud of it. Yogi Berra, baby. There's Yogi Berra Park. Yogi Berra is from the hill. Joe Garagiola is from the hill. Yes, yes. I walk by Yogi Berra's statue every fucking day. Wow. Very <laughs> nice. So Which several... Is nice. uh, so several uh, shows, you're working on several shows, things to look forward to. What should we be looking forward to from you, Brad? Um, well, I think we're going to have something moving in the, in the automotive space pretty soon, and we nice. should have something moving in the um, woodworker space um, pretty oh. soon. Um, we should be hearing about that. A lot of the other stuff still runs on reruns, um, and, and a lot of it still goes in Europe. I mean, our big hit. The thing that got us going was fast and loud on the discovery channel. Yeah. Okay. And that was a major hit and it was our first show. So that kind of blew the doors open for us. And then we were able to get to do uh, a a lot of other things. And um, they still run uh, speed is the new black. We got two seasons of that. That's on motor trend. That was on the speed network. And then they got bought by motor trend and they didn't really want to do a third season. They were kind of really, expensive builds what these guys do right here in st louis that was in st louis uh, the other shows weren't um so you'll be able to see those things they still still run that stuff um but the next two probably in less than a year we'll have um we'll have well we'll have deals on them within the next two weeks finished and um and then they'll go right into production outstanding well done to you, and uh, so good to see you tonight. So good to see everybody, Maddie, Sanj, Brad, everybody uh, watching, and and again, we'll be seeing some of you next week in uh, in Newburgh, New York, at the uh, Cigar Yep, there at Handsome Devil. Ed's been watching. Ed's been commenting. We appreciate you watching, Ed. Um, this is going to be fun. Noon to four p.m. Great barbecue, cigars, whiskey. We're going to have all kind of good stuff, aren't we? Maddie and Sasha. Yes, yes, indeed. We look forward to seeing everybody there. It'll be a great time. It's going to be awesome supporting local charities and uh and yeah. people. And uh, like I said, all of us have been uh have been hurting not having that togetherness. So yeah. it's great being out on the road, getting to see everybody again. Um, like I said, a couple of previous shows, all the barn smokers for Drew Estate have been reestablished, up and running. Um, so it's going to be great getting to see everybody. Gonna it's be a great out. name, guys. It's a great name, guys. That's all for that. I really Cigar love that name. Too. Yeah. We're yeah. Gonna have, uh, we'll see you in Kentucky then, Brad. Bit of Oh, everything. yeah. Yeah. That'll be fun, Brad. That'll be really fun. It'll be great. Kentucky, yeah. We're going to have, it. Uh, is it, Mar- Mario's going to be there with his art, right, Matt? Who else is going to be there? Yes, yes. We got we got a couple. We got the guys from Pig Beach that are going to be up. We have, obviously, Ed and his crew uh, slinging some awesome cue up there. Uh, you got my mug will be up there. Sandra will be up there. PD from uh, Cigars for Warriors. You know, fuck Pizza Tara. Just keep that in mind. You think Cigars for Warriors. <laughs> well, Pizza. we have a few hats for sale there. Is that possible? I, I think I might have to jump in on that. I think this could be gold. I think, this, I think, I think Nike's going to want a part of this. Well, uh, PD might even autograph one for us, right? Ooh, I'm gonna long. I'm gonna long bet that one. I'm. I'm not gonna short you, Matty. I'm going long on on fuck Pete hats. Yes. <laughs> and, I can't get enough. Look, he's, do I get a big caps of fucking Lily not? Come on, that's not how it's like time to do it. Uh, <laughs> and Pete, I'll be bringing some bourbon for you, Pete. I got some bourbon I'm bringing for Pete. Uh, I'm bringing some peerless for Petey. Any more questions anyone has for Sanj and uh, on the SP10? Brad, you're smoking one. What were your thoughts? Here, here it is now. I lit it when we started. Okay. It's gotten better every inch. Every inch, and it's gotten uh, it's super smooth. It's a cool smoke. It never got hot. Okay, this is the first time I had this. I don't know Sanj. I love Maddie. I don't know Sanj. I'm just telling you straight up. 
This is an absolutely incredible cigar. I absolutely love it. I would buy it. I will hook you up, Maddie, with my tobacconist here in St. Louis. John's Pipe Shop is a guy that should know about this. He's been in business 50 fucking yep, years. Right from the yard. Okay. There he is. Do you know him? I bought a, I, you want a lot? I bought a humidor from him probably 20 years ago. Okay, so Gerard. Gerard is the guy. And I got to tell you, Sanj, hats off, babe. Hats yeah. off. And thank you for letting me know the way it's tightly rolled so I wouldn't have made the assumption because the thing here is it's very, it's loosened up. Yes. Okay. And it, you see the distance on it, right? And I love the pigtail on the end of them. I just think it's a cool touch. But the flavor is incredible and there's no heat. Right. Nothing's burning. It just, it's smooth. It's delicious. And I'd never had it before. And I got to tell you, I wouldn't know. I would be like, okay, I got to smoke this. I'm on this. I got to be polite. No, this is a great fucking cigar. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Yes, it really is. It really is. Well done. And we'll be Very well those done. next week, won't we, Sanj? I'm sorry? That'll be one of the featured cigars next week, right? Yes, of course. Yes. Yes, yes. Yep. So I'll be smoking it up. Brad, much love. See you real soon. Thank you, gentlemen. Been very, fun. very grateful. Thank Ladies you. and gents, night, much guys. love for tuning in. Peace out. And let's love everybody. Thank you. <laughs>